So we're going to give, uh, I think we're going to go ahead and we'll start with the background of the centers and then yeah. uh, the plan for today is we're going to give a little bit of a, uh, information about the two different centers. Then uh, Dave from the Ottawa Centre is going to give us a talk on the Perseids themselves. And Maury from the Montreal Centre is going to give us a talk on photographing the Perseids. So I'm going to mute everyone now and um, you can always request to be unmuted. Don't worry about that. And we are going to save questions till the end. Everybody should be able to see today's uh, poster for today's presentation and we're actually really happy to be doing this presentation with the Ottawa Centre. It's uh, one of the nice things right now about Zoom is that we get to do a lot of partner events with other groups. So we've done a few partner events with RASC National and with uh, some of our fellow amateur astronomers here in the Montreal area and so it's nice to do something with the Ottawa Centre which is just down the road for us down the Trans Canada. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, the RASC, the RASC itself is now over 150 years old and there's 29 centers across the country, over 4,000 members. We do members events for observing. We have members workshops and observing programs as well as an outreach to do mandate and education in the greater Canadian community. So we are one of the most large, uh, we are one of the largest most active groups in the world and in Canada we are the largest. The Montreal Centre itself is over 100 years old and we have 170 plus members of all ages. We actually have a very rich and really well um, integrated youth group that helps us with our outreach and does a lot of our observing events with us. Uh, last night a few of us managed to get out to do some observing but we don't have any actual members programs going on yet because of the COVID um, uh, pandemic measures. The national group does a lot of online services as well because of the pandemic. Uh, we've had star parties on Wednesdays once or twice a month uh, starting early on in March. We were sharing the remote telescope early on. We were having uh, keynote presenters and a speaker series with Sky News. And at the moment there's a set of workshops on the Explore the Universe program that may be of interest to a lot of you who want to start seeing some of the deep sky objects within our night sky. Now for the Montreal Centre itself, we do public events and talks throughout the year. We have at least one public event a month. We have clubhouses that normally are held at the Bellevue Observatory at Morgan Arboretum. These days we have two meetings a week on Zoom, Wednesdays and Saturdays. If we have any public events, those take place in lieu of the meeting. And then after the public event, we just continue chatting. So today after this event, if you want to stay on, we'll be chatting and sharing some of our observations from the last week and uh, things that we see in the news and things that we want to chat about that are astronomy and space science related. We give out a monthly, well, bi-monthly newsletter called Skyward that's put together by one of our youth executive members. The Bellevue Observatory that we have in Morgan Arboretum actually has a 14 inch tracking telescope. And at Woolly Woods, we have a 16-inch Dob uh, truss telescope that's our big light bucket, which gives us some nice views from the dark sky. We do outreach and observing events throughout the year. We actually just this week, yesterday, did an outreach event for Beaconsfield Library here on the Perseids and on the summer night sky. And last week, we did an outreach event on the International Space Station. We are... We have a library at John Abbott College, which is where I teach. The library at the moment is off limits, but during the normal course of the year in the winter time, when we don't want to go out observing, we meet up in the library almost weekly for everything from presentations to astrophotography working sessions to poster sessions from some of the research groups, things like that. Visit our calendar anytime if you want to see details of some of our work and some of the things that we're doing. We also have some partners here in the Montreal area and a lot of people have messaged me asking is there any event for the Perseids next week. So for those of you that are francophone or that understand French, the Institute for Research on Exoplanets, IREX at University of Montreal, is doing a Facebook event on Wednesday night where they're going to be having astrophotographers, astrophysicists, and they have the Momigantic uh, Astrolab presenting a little bit on the Perseids. And then between the 13th, or the 11th to the 13th, the uh, planetarium in the Espace pour la Vie is hosting an observing night at the Botanical Gardens here in Montreal. 
the gardens will be open till 1 a.m. so that people who do want to try to observe the Perseids in the city have a space to go where they will be trying their best to follow physical distancing measures. I also wanted to mention that for the Montreal Centre, we're planning a lot for the coming fall. We are planning our, Tomlin, our, our Townsend Lecture, which is our keynote of the year, which will hopefully be on... Uh, sorry, that didn't work. Which will hopefully be in September. We have the International Observe the Moon Night. We have a couple of Mars presentations, hopefully in October. And our spooky nights that we do for kids for Halloween with the John Abbott Space Club is going to most likely be online. And then we have some outreach and some more activities coming up as well. So without further ado, let's get to tonight's keynote. And so I'm going to pass the floor over to Dave Chisholm, who's going to give us a bit on the Ottawa Centre and then give us a talk on the Perseids themselves. Okay, well, th thank you folks for inviting me. Um, I didn't put together a fancy slideshow in the Ottawa Centre, so I'm just going to uh, speak uh, quickly about the Centre. I believe the Ottawa Centre is, is the same age as Montreal or maybe a little bit older. Uh, we meet monthly, actually we have our monthly meeting uh, via Zoom was last night, and uh, we have uh, typically two speakers followed by observations and uh, various other things. Uh, when we meet in person, we have a, a draw where everybody brings in their used astronomy books and stuff. And we have a, a, a door prize. Unfortunately, we can't do that right now. We normally meet at the Canadian Aviation and Space Museum. We've got a partnership with them, which has worked out really well. We've got an amazing um, auditorium with a very powerful projector, high resolution, which allows us to show our images. Uh, when the COVID stuff is not around, we do have public outreach events at the Diefenbunker out in Carp. It's uh, not too far a drive from downtown Ottawa. And uh, we all often get 350, 400 people out. And um, we have our own observatory out near Belmont called the Fred Lossing Observatory. I'm getting some other sounds online here. Um, if somebody needs to be muted, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, and we, we do various workshops. For example, right after Christmas, we always have a telescope workshop for everybody who's got a telescope for Christmas. And uh, we try to show folks how to use them. In terms of, of outreach, I'm the person that does all the most of the outreach to scouts and guides in the Ottawa area. And I normally do it in person. Uh, I switched over to doing it online and I think I've done 25 virtual sessions so far this year with uh, scouts and guides. Uh, just an introduction to astronomy. Okay, so let me uh, see if I can launch my screen here and we'll go into the, uh, the Perseids. Um, oh, I've got to make sure I share my computer sound because I do have a video in here. And Oh, from beginning. Everybody see that okay? Good. Okay, let me, I just got to hide your faces because now I can't see my slides. Uh, hang on a second here. Okay, so uh, first question. Uh, what, does anybody know what the largest near-Earth object is to cross Earth's orbit? You can just shout it out if you want or, or type it in the chat box. I can't see the chat box uh, from where, what I'm looking at right now. I'll let you know if anybody says anything in the chat box. Okay. Any guesses? Okay, we'll go to the next slide. Okay, so the answer is Comet 109P Swift Tuttle. It's 26 kilometers wide as compared to the second largest near-Earth object, 433 Eros, at 17 kilometers wide. And it's the dust left behind by this comet that creates the annual Perseid meteor shower. So who are these Swift and Tuttle guys? Well, uh, Louis A. Swift was an American astronomer who discovered 13 comets and 1,248 previously uncatalogued nebula. He co-discovered a 109P Swift Tuttle in 1862. Horace Tuttle was also an American astronomer who, who co-discovered 55P Temple Tuttle, parent body of the Leonid meteor shower, 109P Swift Tuttle, parent body of the Perseid meteor shower, and 8P Tuttle, parent comet of the Ursid meteor shower. He's credited with the discovery of galaxies NGC 2655 and NGC 66 
43. Uh, the uh, comet uh, Swift Tuttle was, uh, we believe, was also observed on these other dates, which you can see as early as 69 BC and most recently in 1992. Using the previous observations, Brian Marston of the Minor Planet Center calculated the next return of the comet to Earth's orbit. The probability of impact, in the, in the highest probability of impact is in the year 4479. Probability is not that high, it's one in one million. It's estimated that if it did impact the Earth, it would have 27 times more energy than the impactor that wiped out the dinosaurs. I create quite a mess here. And this just sort of shows the, uh, as, as you scroll through where, where the uh, comet is traveling, the dates are up in the upper left-hand corner there. Okay. Next screen. And I've missed a screen. Okay, so let's see if I can get this video to come up. Nope. There we go. Nearly 50 tons of space debris crash onto the Earth every day. While some debris shyly dissipate into the atmosphere, others display a spectacular light show. Meteor showers occur when the Earth's orbit intersects with the orbit of a comet. As comets travel, they leave behind trails of rocky material, oftentimes the size of pebbles or grains of sand, but sometimes as large as boulders. Every year, the Earth crosses these trails of debris, known as meteoroid streams, and the planet becomes sprinkled with rocky material. The debris then race through the Earth's atmosphere, creating friction with air particles and generating vast amounts of heat. This heat vaporizes and illuminates the debris as they fall, creating streaks of light in the sky, popularly known as shooting stars. These celestial light shows are often named after the constellation where they appear to originate as seen from Earth's surface. Meteor showers that seem to fall from the constellation Perseus are called the Perseids, and those appearing from the constellation Gemini are called the Geminids. About 30 meteor showers can be seen from Earth throughout the course of a year. And because the showers are timed with Earth's orbit, the celestial phenomena are cyclical and occur at regular intervals. For example, the Perseid meteor shower happens every August, and the Geminid meteor shower happens every December. Meteor showers have inspired awe and admiration for millennia. In Christian tradition, the Perseid meteor showers symbolize the tears of a saint, St. Lawrence, who was executed in August of the year 258. And in the first century AD, the astronomer Ptolemy believed that shooting stars were a sign of the gods looking upon mortals and listening to their wishes. Inspiring everything from making wishes to reveling at the sky, meteor showers are a reminder of our place in a dynamic and beautiful cosmic ecosystem. Okay, so hopefully you were able to hear the audio in that. So the color of a meteor, it is, uh, if seen out of the corner of the eye, a meteor may appear to give off a flash of white light similar to the way stars appear. However, meteors can appear in a variety of colors if viewing conditions are clear or if they're captured in a photograph. The color of light that the meteors produce depends on their chemical composition. Different chemicals of meteors produce different colors as they burn up while entering the Earth's atmosphere. For example, meteors made from primarily calcium will give off a purple or violet color while those made out of magnesium will appear to have a green or teal color. What a meteor is made out of is not the only factor that determines the color that appears. The speed at which the meteor hits the Earth's atmosphere can also affect the color. The faster a meteor moves, the more intense the color may appear, according to the American Meteorological Society, AMS. Among fainter objects, it seems to be reported that slow meteors are red or orange, while fast meteors frequently have a blue color. So as mentioned in the video, the meteor showers get their name from the apparent radiant constellation from which they appear to be emanating. This radiant appearance is a result of our perspective from Earth viewing the meteors traveling in a parallel, parallel direction 
much like train tracks disappearing into the distance. The Perseids is one of the best meteor showers to observe, producing up to 60 meteors per hour at its peak. It is produced by the Comet Swift Tuttle. The Perseids are famous for producing a large number of bright meteors. The shower runs annually from July 17th to August 24th. It peaks this year in the night of the 11th and the morning of the 12th. The second quarter moon will block out some of the fainter meteors this year. But if between 11 and midnight, the, the moon rises at five minutes after midnight, maybe the best time, but actually any time through the night, even with the moon up, uh, you should still, uh, should still be able to see them. Although they may appear to radiate from the constellation Perseus, they can actually appear anywhere in the sky. And that is my presentation. There we go. Thank you very much, Dave. That was, that was awesome. I love the video as well. That was a really good one. So we're now going to turn over to Maury, who's our past president from here in the Rask Montreal Centre, and he's going to talk a little bit about trying to photograph these meteors that come in the Perseus meteor shower or even in any meteor shower, and a little bit about landscape photography. So Maury, we'll pass it on to you. Okay. Well, thanks a lot. It's great to be here. And um, um, it's great to be with the Ottawa Centre. Seems like a lifetime since last summer where we had that nice um, um, sketching workshop in Ottawa. But times have changed and here we are online and sharing our passion still. So the big challenge for me is see if I could share my screen. So I'm going to try and hopefully uh, if I have trouble, someone will jump in and help me. Because this is the first time I'm doing a Zoom presentation. So I assume I hit share screen. And... I hit this, uh, hopefully, okay, I hit the screen there. Hopefully this is work, going to work. Uh, do you see a screen? No, but have you opened Not your sure. uh, PowerPoint before you started? Uh, yes, I did. Yeah, okay, so I don't see anything yet. No, nothing yet. Not nothing yet? No. no. Okay. You click on the screen, then you click on share. Uh, I did click on share, and now it says select a window. Yep. So yeah, click on your PowerPoint, and then click on share again. PowerPoint and share. Oh, share down there. Okay. Yeah. There we go. There we it's go. coming up. Okay. Too many shares. Yeah. Okay, so it's from the beginning. Okay, do you have the, uh, the screen in front of you? Yep, that's perfect, Mari. Okay, we're moving ahead. That was the hardest part, I think, for me. Okay, so I had to photograph a meteor shower, and here comes the Percy's. But like Karim said, this is really for any meteor shower. Um, we're going to keep it simple tonight because it is a public night and there are people in our group who are much more adapt to astrophotography than I am and I hope I don't bore you but bear with us. Um, I think, think of the Perseids as the people's meager shower and why is that? Well because you don't need any equipment to, to view it which is great. Any basic camera will work and the best of all is the time of the year is nice warm evenings um, as opposed to the Geminis, which is maybe a better meteor shower, but it could be, it might cool in December to be up there. Um, now I'm going to be, keep it very basic, and there's tons of online videos that you can look at after on your own. So let's get started. Uh, what do you need? Well, you need a camera, but don't get hung up on equipment, at least not yet. Uh, here I'm going to give a slight warning or um, astrophotography can be a habit-forming experience, and it can get expensive if you want it to be. But it, like astronomy, it doesn't have to be expensive if you don't want it to be. But it can get to be expensive, as we all know. But you need a camera. It doesn't have to be a fancy camera. It could be a DSLR. Nothing it doesn't have to be top of the line. It could be a point-and-shoot camera. And although I haven't tried it, it could even be your cell phone. And if you don't have a camera, 
I believe Nicole was in our in our audience. She'll tell you that you can even sketch the uh, the per sheets. So your audience could be your camera. Now, what else do you need? Here you have your camera. Well, you gotta have batteries. So I recommend having more than one battery. Have, make sure you charge them up before the evening and bring extras. You don't wanna run out of battery power. Uh, you'll be taking lots and lots of images. So make sure you have a good video uh, memory card, an SD card, um, as large as you could afford to get. And make sure that the speed of the card is quick. You don't, you're gonna be shooting a lot of pictures and what could be a lag is the buffering, the time the camera takes to read the card. And when that backs up, basically you're left staring at the camera because it won't function. So invest in a good card and bring extra cards if you need to. Because we will be shooting what we call raw format, which I'll explain later, which uses a lot of memory. Now, you can't hold your camera with your hands. You're gonna be using long exposure, so you need a tripod, and any tripod will do. You don't need anything fancy. Any tripod that you have at home will, will suffice. You don't have a tripod where you could pop it up on a uh, fence or your car or whatever and secure it with bags of rice or something, but a, cam a good camera tripod is, is a good investment if you don't have one, but make do what you have for this time. And on top of the tripod, you notice there's just a little uh, plate there. Well, you'll need a, a ball head or a, a gear head or a pan head, whatever is on the tripod. Most likely you'll have a pan head, which is the one on the far right centered. Um, usually those are for movies, but they'll hold your camera and that's what you want. You just want to get a nice solid surface. So again, don't get hung up on equipment. Okay, um, you're gonna be setting up, hopefully before it gets too dark, but eventually it will get dark and you won't be able to see too well. So you'll need some sort of flashlight. Now astronomers always use red flashlights or red lights. That's so that their eyes don't get maintained or vision in the dark. It's very handy to have a headlamp, that way your hands are free. But if you don't have that, you can pick them up cheaply at the dollar store. And if they don't have red on it, just take a red marker and go over to the, uh, the uh, lens of the, uh, the headlamp. This way your hands are free. Otherwise you're gonna be using a regular flashlight and holding it in your mouth, which is not a good idea. And at the dollar store, they're obviously not expensive. Um, you're going to be taking lots of images, lots of images, and shooting the meteors is an act of luck. You're going to be looking one direction, and if you're in a crowd, you're going to hear a lot of oohs and ahs, and you're going to go under, why didn't I see it? Well, they're happening everywhere in the sky, as was mentioned. And I have a habit of looking in the wrong spot always. So what you want to do is set up your camera with either what's called an intervalometer or a remote trigger. Now, an intervalometer, which are what you see on the screen, come in different formats. The one at the bottom is a wired one that connects into your camera. And the one at the top is a wireless one. So you could hold the uh, controller somewhere else, either as you're sitting up and relaxing or in your car or whatever. And what this does, you program it to take a picture at a certain interval, every 15 seconds, 20 seconds, whatever you wish. And you, the camera works on its own until either the batteries go dead or the memory card goes full. In between that, you can sit back or lie on the ground and enjoy the, the fireworks display and just enjoy yourself. They're not expensive, especially if you get them on uh, Amazon. If you don't have this, you could have just an interval uh, remote trigger. Now that doesn't have a timer. So what you have to do is stand there next to your camera and keep clicking on it every few seconds. Why do you want to use one of these? Is that you're not touching your camera. If you touch the camera to shoot the picture, you're going to shake the camera. And that's not a good thing. If you don't have one of these, don't worry. If your camera has a remote timer built into it, or a self-timer. 
you could use that and set it to the two, two second or three second, whatever um, delay hit it. You'll have to, then it'll go off in two or three seconds. And that will work. It'll be a little slower, not perfect, not the ideal situation, but it'll work. Some cameras have an intervalometer built into it in your menu section. You have to go through it and look for interval trigger, interval timing. It's built into your camera. That's great. Very easy to use. So you need something like that. We have two things that we don't like in astronomy. One is clouds. Can't do anything about those. We call it the Montreal Nebula. And the other thing is black flies and mosquitoes. Unfortunately, that comes with the territory and the best thing is to be prepared. We can guarantee you next week there's gonna be mosquitoes out there. So go prepare. Don't forget your uh, insect repellent, whatever you like. Some people like these, uh, what's on the right-hand side, the, the uh, bug nets, they work great. Or what's become popular are these electronic uh, thermocells. They seem to work if there's no wind. If there's wind or you're moving around, they're not very good. So come with bug repellent and if you have a thermocell, still bring some bug repellent. Word of caution, bug repellents like uh, Deep Woods Off or any of those, they're not friendly to our skin and must, more so, they're not friendly to our camera equipment. So if you put it on your hands, try not to put it on your fingers too much or wipe it off. And if you do, don't touch anything that's rubber because it's going to sort of melt it and do all sorts of bad things to your camera. And definitely don't touch the lens. So be very careful when you use it. Now, as I mentioned, the camera is going to be working on its own, so you may as well be comfortable. No need to stand around there. Grab your chair, bring a sleeping bag, a blanket, a thermocell, sleeping pad, whatever you feel comfortable with, and sit back, lean back, lie back, look at the sky, and just enjoy the show. Of course, you've got to have the essentials, so bring some snacks. Bring a thermos of coffee, tea, um, whatever you wish. You're going to be there for a while. It's a it's um activity. You're going to be busy for at least a couple of hours, hopefully. So uh, bring some things to keep you happy. And so, where do you where to set up? Location, location, location. As a real estate agent would tell you, location is everything. There's lots of tools to help us online, apps that will help you determine where the best location is. Um, some of these are free, some of them aren't. And I put some dollar signs to give an idea. Um, try the first, the free ones first, download as many as you want, you don't like it, delete them. No problem before you spend money. And if you do buy them, they're usually quite cheap. Um, Stellarium is a very good one. I believe it's available on Mac and PC. It's free. Um, I have some screen grabs there. Spice Safari, you used to have a free version. I believe now you've got to pay for it. It may have different um, versions or levels you could buy. A lot of this is if you're beyond looking for um, meteors, but more if you're doing other astronomical observing and you want to control your telescope or the mount to the telescope with your camera or iPad or computer. Um, a program like PhotoPills is a great tool. It's not free, but it's not that expensive. It's available on Mac and, or iOS and Android. Um, and it's used to plan where you want to view. If you have a site and you want to shoot the perceive, but have a church in the background, they'll tell you what time and what location and the angle and everything so that you're doing all the planning ahead of time. Atmospheric is a great program and it tells you the condition of the night sky ahead of time. We mentioned that it looks good, and if you go online, it, atmospheric um, or a deep sky clock will tell you the conditions for seeing, clouds, and a whole bunch of other information, so you can plan your, your evening uh, better. And there's a lot more. If you just go on um, the uh, what's it, Google Store or whatever, or the Apple Store, App Store, just look under astronomy, you'll see a ton of apps that you could try out. Oh, go crazy. 
So this is a um, Valerian, and you can see the, uh, this is for um, the 11th, which is Tuesday at um, uh, 11.36 at night. And as it gets darker, you can see the Perseids in the middle, bright yellow label and where it's located. You'll see Cassipedia, big W in the sky, it's easy to see. It gives you an idea of where or the radiant is or where they're going to be coming out. Now, as it was mentioned, don't be up, coming up in that direction. And that's like looking at when you're driving in a snowstorm and the snow is coming directly at you. But you could point your camera virtually anywhere in the sky and uh, hopefully you'll get lucky. And you could, with um, Stellarium, you could change the time. And as the time gets up later in the day, evening or earlier in the morning, uh, the radiant will rise and it gets to be better conditions for viewing. So you could either uh, do an all sky uh, image, or if you like, an image with some scenic uh, elements in it. It's up to you what you want to do. There's no right or wrong answers to this. It's what you enjoy. And uh, so hopefully I'm not going too fast. But I was told I only had 15 minutes, 20 minutes. And as Karim will mention, could tell you, when I get started talking, I should have mentioned that you should all go for snacks and gear, get ready for it. But so you set up your camera, you pick your location, um, set your equipment on the tripod. As I mentioned, you should get to the site before it gets dark. Nothing worse than getting to a site and you're tripping on the on rocks and whatever, then dropping your equipment. Get there early, um, set it up, take your time, don't panic. Figure out what you want to do. Do you want to do some time lapse, which we'll show you, some single images, um, and just have fun, have lots of patience. Um, in terms of your lens, if you have a DSLR, you may have different lenses from wide angle to telephoto. You want the widest field of view your camera can see. So a wide angle lens, even a fisheye is great because you don't know where the, the, uh, the meteor is going to show or the meteor is going to show up where the person is going to be. So you, if you have a, a tell like you don't want a telescope, you don't want a binoculars, the angle of view is just too narrow. You're not going to, you won't be lucky enough. A wide angle lens, if you have a DSLR and you have a zoom lens, pick one that's with a, a shorter or uh, focal length of 24, 28 millimeter, 36 maybe. Um, if you have a prime lens, go with a, as wide as possible. Fish eye, eight millimeters, six millimeters. If you have a point and shoot, chances are it's a zoom lens. So again, pick the setting that so the wide, gives the widest field of view. It gives you the best chance to, to get lucky. So choose your lens, you set your correct exposure, always shoot manually, always manual. Um, it's not as daunting as you think, and uh, it's the only way to do it. Now, as I mentioned, you got aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. You could think of this as the exposure triangle, or it's a balancing act. When you change one, you gotta change the other so, so that everything's in balance so that you get the right exposure. And again, that's why I'm saying at the end, go out um, tonight, tomorrow night, Monday night, whatever night. Don't have to go anywhere far. Excuse me. Um, and just pick an object in the sky. It could be the moon or a bright star. And just set up your camera wherever you wish, your front porch, your back porch, your front yard, wherever you want, not in the middle of the street. Safety is good. And just do it as a practice session so that when you go out for the proceeds, you, you're not starting from scratch. You have an idea of what to do. The conditions of the night will be different. So there's no magic exposure number that we could give you. Um, it all depends on things like the moon, how bright the moon is. Is there street lights in your area? Uh, how bright is the evening uh, or how dark is the sky? How bright is the sky? So the exposure, there's no magic uh, formula. You just have to go out there and 
do a bunch of tests and then determine what the best is for that situation. So you, again, you've got the aperture to play with, the shutter speed, and the ISO. Aperture is how wide the lens will be or how much light goes through the lens. Shutter speed is how long that light will be going through the lens to the sensor or what used to be the film. And the ISO is how sensitive or that the light will be treated or how sensitive the sensor will be. So working with all three elements, you, get, you work out your proper exposure. And on your back of your camera, when you take a picture, some cameras have a histogram. And that tells you, or gives you an idea of how well the exposure is. If the light is, the histogram is too far to the left, it's going to be too dark. If it's too far to the right, it's overexposed. It should be more or less in the middle or a little bit to the left, actually. And if it's too dark, it means there's not enough light, either open up the lens or increase the ISO or play with the shutter speed. And the same thing if it's too dark. So you just play with those elements and you'll get a feel of what's happening. Um, you have a choice of shooting in JPEG or RAW. Always shoot in RAW. You can shoot with some cameras, you can shoot a JPEG and a RAW together, but the RAW image is, or the RAW file is the most important file. Now that's going to give you the largest file. And with today's cameras, which are 30, 40, even 60 meg, um, megabytes of data, that makes very large files, so you need very large memory cards. But you want that data later on when you start playing with your, your, your file, your image on the computer. The JPEG file does not have all that data, so it's very limited how you could fix it up. It's, this image that you see on your screen is a JPEG image, it's processed. But the raw file, when you bring it in, you could play with it. You could change the, um, the lightness, how dark it is, and I'll show you a bit of that. You could also um, change the, um, oh, I'm getting a brain freeze, um, whether it's daylight, auto, uh, tungsten lighting, whatever. You can play with that. Don't worry about that. All that can be changed later on. So a good starting exposure to try would be something like say 13 seconds, an ISO of 3200, F1.4 if your camera has it, if your lens has it. If it doesn't, 2.8, 3.5, depends on the camera. And just play with it. And it's a trade-off because depending on your camera, some cameras, particularly at night, a high ISO is gonna give you noise. You can think, think of noise as film grain. It's those little dots or pattern. You want to minimize that. You go with a focal length of 1.4 if you have it, or 1.8. <clears throat> That's very good. But if the lens is not of a good quality, it's going to give some aberrations to it. So it's particularly on the edges. Um, so you might, you kind of lens, you might want to use 2.8, 3.5, 5.6 even just to get a better quality lens, but it's gonna mean um, less light is getting in. <coughs> the time, 13 seconds, that also depends on the lens. If you have a wide angle lens, you can go up to about 30 seconds. If you go too long and your, the stars are gonna start looking like little dashes. So you don't want that. So you wanna figure out the best time to do that or best shutter speed. But when you're doing your test, you could do all that. You take a picture, then go with the, in the magnification, like 10 times magnification on your camera, and just look at the details very carefully. How are the, the stars nice and sharp? Um, are they dashes? Well, if they're dashes and you want to sharpen, you've got to reduce the speed. Some people are not that finicky. It's a lot to determine what is your threshold. So don't worry, you just try it. Um, you're focusing, again, you have autofocus or manual focus. Like the exposure, always use manual. Why? The camera is not going to be able to focus on a star, it's too far away. They'll be hunting and seeking, and it's just not going to be a pleasant experience, believe me. So use manual and I can either use live view on your screen or look through the viewfinder and uh, 
this practice on focusing. Now you might have noticed at the end of the lens on, on the focusing ring on a DSLR, you have this thing called infinity. That in theory is for the furthest this object away. Now obviously the meteor is gonna be as far away as it could get, but for the lens, infinity is not always infinity. Sometimes it's a little plus or minus on either side of the, 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 that mark. So again, before you made, once it gets dark, you're gonna do some practicing. You're gonna set up the exposure. You're gonna practice some focusing, start off in infinity, take the shot. Once you got the exposure right, take the shot, look at the star once it's enlarged on the screen and see if it's sharp or it could be a planet, anything like that. If it's not sharp, just take that ring and nudge it a little to the left or move it to the right, try a few times. You're not using film, it's not costing you anything, so don't worry about it. And just play with it until you get that as sharp as you think you can get it. And once you get it, take some tape, either what they call gaffer tape, because um, it doesn't leave any residue, or some sort of tape like that, that's easily removed, um, we call electrical tape, and just put a little bit of tape on the focusing ring. Why? This way you won't accidentally move it out of focus when you're doing, moving around in the dark. You don't want to do that, because then you've got to start over. You don't, that's not a good thing. So just take a bit of tape, it's a little trick, and just put a little bit of tape on the focusing ring so it doesn't move, and you're good to go. So now what do you do? You've taken all these pictures and you've got tons of things in your camera and you may have shot hundreds of pictures on for the Percy or thousands, who knows? You've got to figure them out. Well, there's some software you could use. One is very popular is Adobe Lightroom and Adobe Bridge. And there's also other software for the PC and Mac. But if you go into store, the uh, various um, Apple stores or whatever. A lot of it is free, you can try it, and some aren't. And um, it's a good way to go through it and you can eliminate, first of all, all the bad pictures. And there's gonna be bad pictures, don't worry about it. As we mentioned, shooting the meteors is an, it's an exercise in luck, as much as skill. The composition of the picture, yes, that's skill, it's having a vision, that comes with doing photography. Or being, if you're an artist, you have that vision already. But getting, capturing the, the meteor, that's luck. You don't know where they're going to be. And they could come from left, right, top, center. You just don't know. You have no control over nature. So there's going to be a lot of pictures that are just garbage. You might even catch some airplanes passing through. Or what we call Starlink, or now unfortunately happens to Starlink uh, satellites from SpaceX. Guarantee we'll catch some, capture some of those. So this is uh, Adobe Lightroom. Now for the last five years, of, I don't know if Karim mentioned, I was the president of RASP Montreal. And when you're president, you don't get to do anything other than stand at an information table or when it's a Percy's, which is a very popular event, we get sometimes three to 500 people, you end up directing traffic. And you don't get to observe anything. Fortunately now I'm not president and I was hoping to observe everything, and then this COVID thing happened, and through a whole, that didn't work out very well. But anyways, I have faith. This was taken a few weeks through, uh, last Saturday, I think it was, and I was intrigued by the clouds and the moon. But this is um, Lightroom, and it just brings up all the pictures you've taken, and you could eliminate them, the good ones, and keep the bad ones. Just, so you don't have to go through it one by one. You can see them all at once, and then you could organize them. A very handy tool, Lightroom, but you have to pay for it, and it's on a subscription basis. If you're a photographer, there's a very good package. It's I think ten dollars US. It gives you uh, Photoshop and Lightroom and Acrobat, Acrobat, I believe. Uh, and if you're going to use it on a regular basis, it's a good deal. But if you're not, then there's other options uh, out there, and I'll mention some of those. But Lightroom is very good. Another one is um, in Lightroom, you could also do some editing. You have a library mode, you have a develop mode. And in the develop mode, you could do some basic editing. Not everything, but quite a bit. You could bring up a lot of details. You could play with the exposure, the contrast, the white balance. That's the term I couldn't think of. 
few minutes ago. Um, again, if you're shooting in RAW, don't worry about it because you could change it. And unlike if it's JPEG, um, one trick is sometimes to change it to the daylight after. It just brings out some colors. It's whatever you like, whatever is pleasing to you. And that's what counts. Is you're happy and it looks good, then it's good to go. So you can play with the exposure, the contrast, the highlights, shadows, whatever. And the nice thing with Lightroom is when you're doing the editing, and I apologize if I'm going fast because I was told we had a time limit. Um, so there's a lot of videos online on how to use it. A lot of YouTube videos and everything like that. Um, it's called non-destructive. It's one file. It's a very big file because it's a raw file. So it could be 20, 30 megabytes a file. But you can make the changes, but it's not making a duplicate file. It's just making a reference file. So you can always go back to the original if you don't like what you did. Or you can make a duplicate. And so it's a very handy tool for to use to, to eliminate the bad images, catalog your images, you give them keywords. Because if you get into this, you're going to have tons and tons of thousands of images from different um, sessions out in this, doing astronomy or astrophotography and other photography. You got to keep it organized. Otherwise, you'll never find it again. Because we're dealing with so many files. So it's good to be organized. We give it keywords like moon, uh, Perseus, the date, astrophotography, and anything else you wish to uh, think of. Now, <clears throat> you might want to do some photo editing. Go beyond what you can do in Lightroom. So Photoshop is the, probably the most famous, popular uh, program, but again, you have to pay for it. Um, there is that package I mentioned, I think they call the photographer's package, it's about $10 US, so it's not bad. Um, there used to be a program, I'm not sure if it's still out there, Adobe Elements. That program you bought, and at times it was even free if you bought a scanner. I'm not sure. I think it's still, it's under $100, I believe, at, um, I was going to say, uh, Future Shop by Best Buy. Um, and it's a, it's a light version of Photoshop, and that's good enough for most people. Because most of the, um, Features of Photoshop you'll never use is for doing heavy photo manipulation, merging photos together, creating those famous photos of Trump where looking like a clown, all that's done in Photoshop. Um, we're not going to do that. You don't need it. But so Elements has probably all the tools you'll need, and it's a one time purchase, which is nice. Another op option is called Affinity Photo. It's available both on Mac and PC through the stores. I believe it's around $80. But it's a one-time purchase, and it is apparently very, very good. They had a uh, free trial version at the beginning of the COVID shutdown to get people to use it. Um, tons of videos online on it on YouTube. It's almost a mainstream option to Photoshop, and um, it's quite good. There is a free program called GIMP, I believe it's called. Um, I haven't used it because I use Photoshop for work. Um, and I believe it's, it's usable, but it's not as user friendly. The interface is not as friendly, but if you are uh, handy with the computer, it's worth giving it a try. Um, works on Mac, uh, Windows and Linux or whatever it's called. Um, and it's free. So you can try it, don't like it, get rid of it. Nothing ventured, nothing gained, as they say. So you could do a time lapse, which is taking all your images that you've taken, the best one, and merging it into a little video like this one. Of course, it's not as fancy as our other video that we saw from Ottawa, but and depending on where you set your camera, if you set it with um, Polaris in the middle. As we know that Polaris doesn't move like all the other stars. Every star moves around Polaris or North Star. So if you have Polaris in the middle while you're doing this time lapse, you're going to see all the stars rotating in a circle. And occasionally you're going to see a meteor go through it. It's a lot of fun. If you want to just do a time lapse, there's some things you can figure out. Like, <clears throat> how long do you want the movie to be? You don't want it too long. It's not a major motion picture. So you got to figure out the length of the movie, the interval between shots, how long each shot will be. And there's time-lapse calculators available online if you just Google time-lapse calculator. So it makes it very easy to do your planning ahead of time. 
If you're going to think of trying that, do all your planning before you go out there in the field. Very important. Plan, plan, plan. Makes your life easier. Okay, now you've taken all these great pictures. You've made a time last video. You want to share it. Well, we live in an age of social media, Facebook, Instagram, Flickr, Google Photos, uh, whatever. You want to share it. Share your uh, successes. And if you're, become, if you're a member of a responding club or whatever, share your failures. Um, learn by your mistakes. I'm not good at this. I'm just learning. I'm always learning. That's what I like about RASC and the Montreal Center. You, there are many people that are so much better than you in doing something. And you, you might be better in other things, but we learn from each other. And that's what makes joining RASC or an astronomy club so good. It's a, probably the best investment you can make in your astronomy uh, toolbox. It's better than buying a new eyepiece or the latest camera, the latest telescope is join a club and learn from others. So that's my pitch for the club. Um, as I mentioned, the Canadian Space Agency CSA put out a call for images of the purse seats. We posted that in the messages or whatever it was called. Um, I posted ahead. Um, we put the hashtag, hashtag discover the sky. They're going to pick up the images and perhaps share it on their social media account. So you get a bit of an immortality or bragging rights. Uh, they don't pay you, but you have bragging rights. Sometimes that's better. And if you want some tips, um, this uh, site here, go to it. There's lots of tips on shooting the perceives. And there's lots of other tips from other sites. So it's quite good. Also, I'll just go back to this one. If you notice the, up here, you notice all the, uh, this is probably a composite image when you bring many images together and bring them together in Photoshop. But you can see they're all coming towards, that's probably taken uh, from where the, the Perseids originate or orient coming out. And you can see all the different colors of them. So it's quite interesting. Okay, so moving ahead, we have some photos from our members that graciously allowed me to share them. So we'll go ahead. Uh, first is David Schumann. Now, David is, um, is he's a, when I say I'm learning, I learned from David. He's a really good photographer. He does a lot of deep space stuff. Um, so uh, we all learn from each other. So here's some from David. Um, you can see if one of them screen down here, like I say, you don't know where it's going to be. Uh, this is probably from the Morgan Arboretum, I'm guessing. And there's uh, another one. Sometimes they're very short. And like I said, it's an act of luck. So if you see one, it's too late to take a picture. They're gone. It's, so you gotta be, that's why the camera's just taking pictures, taking pictures. And when you go back home the next day, because that night you're going to be tired unless you're really excited, you're going to be surprised at what you got. And that's the best thing. And then you'll be calling everybody up and saying, wow, what a night. Now, sometimes you're, you're going to get a, one, but you might get a, a guest photobombing your shot, and this was an airplane. And we're gonna see a lot of Starlinks images, unfortunately, photobombing our shots. Uh, it's just turning into an unfortunate reality. But it makes it interesting, interesting conversation anyways. And uh, under normal times of other years, not this year, the person is a very popular event, particularly if it's not a full moon. We've had some nights where events where it's a full moon and, well, the full moon is like having a giant floodlight in the sky, just wipes out everything. And it never gets really dark. But when it's a dark night and the press picks it up and there's a lot of action, a lot of excitement about it and the conditions all come together, no clouds, no moon, we get a crowd. We've had crowds of up to 500 people and we had to bring in security and it's just fantastic especially when you hear all the, all the oohs and ahs. And the best thing is when you get kids seeing it for the first time and the adults, it's just an amazing feeling that you're sharing something that's there. And a lot of people have just never seen it before. Be surprised. And uh, this is the, what the Bellevue Observatory is. It's here. This is obviously a very wide angle fisheye lens. 
uh, view, and you can see all the people in the field with their blankets, a few telescopes looking at other things, and uh, just going to enjoy a fantastic evening under the nature's fireworks. Uh, another type of camera, as I remember, Gerald um, uses what's in this case, an all, I believe it's called an all-sky all camera. It's just quite a specialized tool, and it's just set up, and it's constantly taking pictures of the sky. I won't go into the technical details, because I just don't know them. Uh, I'll admit that. But it gives you a very, you know, something that's always taking the pictures of the sky, wherever it's set up. So we took, I took, he gave me, a, I don't know, about 40 images, and uh, we'll see if it works gives a, a kind of a, a time lapse and you can see they're just everywhere so it depends on where you're pointing so having an intervalometer going is kind of like having a, an all sky camera going it does all the work for you you just sit back on your chair your blanket have a snack and just enjoy the sit, enjoy it and that's what it's all about enjoying it and having fun Okay, now there's other uh, meter showers. We've got the Perseids. Uh, David Levy is, we're very honored to have David Levy here. He's the king of meteors, a very famous uh, comet hunter um, in Canada. And uh, he shared this one of the Leonids, which was in April. So again, so they're all over. And just because the Perseids is uh, Tuesday or Wednesday, they're going to be around for a while, so if you don't get out there or the weather turns bad on Tuesday, Wednesday, and it's better on Friday, it may not be as, as many, but you'll still see some. And there's, there's meteors all, all year round, actually. So don't worry if it's not good on those nights or you just can't make it because it's, it's a work night and you can only go out on Friday. I looked and Friday looked, looked very good. Go out on Friday night and just give it a shot. A bit of photo humor there. So... And then you got the Geminids, which is more meteors, but it's quite cold. But in some ways, it's, the sky is pure, it's crisper in winter. So you just dress warm and uh, enjoy that. In winter, you've got to have a few more concerns about your camera. Batteries go dead faster, so you got to keep them warm, bring more batteries. But enjoy those too. No reason to stay inside during winter. We're Canadian. Get out there. And again, Best thing to do before going out on Tuesday or Wednesday or whenever, practice before the big show. Take your camera out tonight, tomorrow night, Monday night, whatever night's good for a few minutes, an hour, set it up wherever. Practice focusing, practice getting that exposure right, watch some videos, make some notes. So when you go out there, you're not in a panic. When you're in a panic, you're just wasting a lot of energy and it's not going to be good. You're going to get frustrated. Even the best of us get frustrated when things don't work. But to prevent that, do your planning ahead of time. And just go out there and have fun. So that completes my show. And now I will stop sharing and uh, pass it back to Karim. Thank you very much, Maury, and uh, thank you again to Dave. And before we go to the q and I'm actually going to call on uh, David, uh, David Levy. He had, at the start of the session, given us a little bit of a, of a poetry reading from Tennyson. So he's going to uh, share that with us before we go to the Q&A. Well, thank you very much. <clears throat> and. Um, yeah, I came on tonight and I just gave a quick quote from Tennyson. I know I'm very old, but I'm not that old that I knew Alfred Lord Tennyson. But I should say that I do know his great grandson, Jonathan Tennyson. I've actually met with him in London and uh, find him a very interesting person. Anyway, my quote is from Tennyson's The Princess. And it goes like this. Now's now lies the earth all day nigh to the stars, and all thy heart lies open unto me. Now slides the silent meteor on, and leaves a shining furrow as thy thoughts in me. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. And uh, 
we will now open up to questions. Does anybody have any questions that they want to ask to our speakers or just ask out uh, to the to the general audience? And uh, let's chat. I have a question. David Schumann. Yeah, we were uh, saying early on in the presentation that the dust trail that's left behind and burns up in the atmosphere is what we see for the meteor shower. And I'm wondering, because these are laid by comets, the comets are mostly um, um, ablative gases, like subliminal, subliming gases. Is it uh, like rocky material caught up in the uh, comet nucleus that's shed by the um, uh, the nucleus that ends up burning up in the atmosphere because it's not the gases that that end up subliming. Um, so I was wondering, where is that? Is that the heart of the comet? Um, I, I don't know who can answer that one. Uh, Did you want to, Dave, or shall I? You, you can go ahead. So uh, keep in mind that the comet has two tails. One that we see is the dust and the gas, and the other one that we see is the ion tail. Yeah. So a lot of the gas actually is in the ion tail, and it's the gas that's caught up with the dust that you tend to see in the large dust tail that is so magnificent from Neowise just last month. The rocks and the pebbles that come out from the dust is what we see as meteoroids. Yeah. The gas itself doesn't tend to stick around too much, but some of it does get caught up inside those meteoroids. And so that's why oftentimes when you have those big fireballs, what's happening is you have not just the rock burning up, but you also have some of the gas being released. Mm -hmm. And so then there's multiple colors and multiple elements that you see burning up. Thank you. Yep. Other questions? I have a question. Sure, Santiago. Um, often when taking, uh, you know, pictures of uh, Perseids, uh, you have to kind of decide uh, what's your maximum exposure, you know, without uh, b making the sky too bright. So, uh, any uh, suggestions, anyone, or by experience, uh, or? I'm not good. Well, like I said, you don't want the sky too bright, so it's like shooting the moon. Um, it's just a question of practicing or trying different settings to get to the what looks best. There is no magic number because there's, there's so many variables that we don't control. Like, is it a full moon? Is it a partial moon? Um, how much light pollution is in it in the area? Thanks. So, so there is no answer to your question. <laughs> It also well, depends on how long of an exposure you want to do or what focal length you're using. Right? Yeah, I, I think uh, the, the reminder is that uh, you have to like watch a couple of pictures bef before you just, uh, you don't just start the pictures and let them go. You got to <laughs> yeah. keep an no, eye on and then decide. Or... So no, when we were fun. out last night, I was playing around with uh, some short exposure, uh, 15 seconds, and I loved the amount of light that was in them. And then I tried one bulb mode and I set the wrong ISO and the whole thing is washed out. Yeah. No, that's why I said you have to, when, once it gets dark enough, start practicing. Don't, you know, set it up and wait till it's, it's dark and then just hope that you're going to get it right the first time. So you're not. Good advice. One thing to keep in mind is the radian. The closer you point your camera to the radian or the emanation point of the Perseids, uh, many times the shorter the meteorites will be because they don't have time to trail across the sky. So if you want that uh, warp speed effect, that's a good thing to point to. But if you want the longer trail meteors, sometimes you have to point the camera randomly in, in different parts of the sky. Uh, think about it three-dimensionally, the geometry. You know, it, it also boils down to your camera. You have to know what your camera is capable of doing. Um, because like that, like uh, some cameras don't work very well at night, so you may have to play with them a bit, to, uh, play with your camera a bit, just to see what kind of results you can get. That's why you should try practicing with it, you know, just as the, as the night gets darker. Yeah, I and mean, then you and start to figure out where your where your limitations are with your camera. The greatest limitation probably is in the ISO, 
in that the lower end cameras at night, the high ISOs just do not do well. You just get an astro well, again, bad pun, but an astronomical amount of digital noise. <laughs> Whereas the better cameras, and I hate to admit it, but Sony cameras seem to work very well at night. And you can't, yeah, David, get that burnt screen off your face. Uh, work really well at night and you get very clean images at the higher ISOs. Uh, same thing with a cheap lens. Um, for example, ca Canon lenses, there are three grades of Canon lenses from consumer lenses that are really relatively inexpensive to what they call the L series, which are rather quite expensive into the thousands of dollars of le per lens. But those L lenses, you can shoot them wide open or very near wide open without getting any aberrations where you can't do that with um, the cheaper line of lenses. So you have, like Paul said, you've got to work with what, work with the equipment that you have. Yeah. But don't use that as a limiting factor for not doing it or trying yeah, to do it. Yeah, yeah. Don't, don't, let your don't let your camera stop you. Don't no. just... Get out there and have fun. That's the whole idea. If it doesn't work, come out in December and shoot the Geminids. <laughs> As Maury said, it's worth a shot. It's worth a shot. Uh, e even a cell phone on fireworks mode. That was actually one of the things that Maury was mentioning was being able to use cell phones. And one of the things to keep in mind is you do want a holder for your cell phone or a tripod or something if you're going to use your cell phone because you need to stabilize it well. But a lot of the cell phones also have intervalometer apps to, that work with the cameras. So I have an app on my phone that I can use with my Canon camera with not all of the different things I can do with the Canon, but it gives me a, a small range of the options. And it allows me to be able to sit and check my images and take new ones remotely with the camera. And so these days, a lot of the newer cameras have that capability with your cell phone, which makes it much, much easier to be able to sit and control your camera without shaking it at all. Other yeah. questions, or shall we move on into just a general chat? Kareem, I got a question for Maury and maybe uh, others. Um, okay. You discussed uh, <laughs> using a, a, a tripod, a regular tripod, but what what uh, is there any particular um, 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 settings that we have to use if we use, a, let's say, a sky guider, for instance, so we can shoot longer with it, we can guide. But um, is it practical using a sky guider? You know, like uh, like from my Optron, you can do, you can use uh, longer exposures, but um, you know. Yeah, I mean, if you want to keep your camera point, pointed towards that the radiant point, which is not necessarily Polaris, right? Keep the radiant point constant in the center. Okay. Give that a try. It'll reduce your star trails too. And yeah, also, al also allows you, yeah, it'll also allows you to shoot at a longer exposure. You don't get the dashes. Yeah. You don't have to worry about what they call the 400 or 500 rule. Yeah, I'm going to try it with the, uh, my, uh, my 11 16 to 16 uh, wide angle. If you look at the settings that I had on our Astro camera, <laughs> that was a a really first first trial. And um, if we did it again, I wouldn't open the gain so much. The gain uh, was set at around 450. Yeah, the gain is the worst. <laughs> Are you planning on using it next week for the Perseids? Uh, if we get a chance. Is it up north or do you have it with you in the city? Uh, well, the camera, we didn't, we didn't bring the camera with us, but we're going back into town tomorrow. And we may come back up uh, on, uh, on the 11th. Okay. One of the things Maury was mentioning was taking some nice landscape pictures with the Perseids if you're able to actually catch one. and. Uh, I was thinking Mike O'Hara was saying that he's in the London area and the Georgian Bay, the cliffs on the side oh, and yeah. the waterfront. Oh my, I'm jealous. I, I actually oh, yeah. am wishing I was down in southwestern Ontario for that. Yeah, I was watching a video last night on someone doing that and I go, oh my God, I've got to find a site like that. But uh, Mike, have you been up that way? 
Uh, not yeah, not recently for at nighttime. So we the London Club's got a uh, uh, uses the uh, Tingle Wildlife Management Area down near Lake Erie. Okay. And it's out kind of the, the south end. Yeah, so we can look across the lake, and we see a little bit of Cincinnati light, but other than that, we get a nice clear dark sky. Down around there, you have the dark area near Point Pelee, right? Yeah, yeah, that's. Um, we were down there at Port Pelee and uh, actually Long Point is the best place in oh, Ontario. Yeah, and no, um, I I've had only done Sorry, yeah, we had a camera club down there a couple of weeks ago taking pictures of the Comet and the Milky Way. And we were using, most of them had crop sensor cameras. So we we're using the rule of 300 to sort of give them a, a starting point for the exposure time. So you didn't get any start drills and worked out fairly well. Excellent. I have to take a trip down there next time. Uh, last time I came down that way, I went up to Sudbury, and the time before that, I went uh, to the Kitchener Waterloo uh, to Conestogo Lake. Mm -hmm. But I haven't gotten as far as London recently, and I, I think I need to come out that way. Yeah, I'd like to be up to the Manitoulin in one. They have a dark, uh, dark sky up there, and I haven't had the chance to get up there. Yeah. Oh, Gordon's Park is amazing. Yes. It's, uh, it's breathtaking. It really is. All right, so I'm going to stop the recording and we can just open it up to an overall chat. But first, uh, let's thank Maury and Dave one more time. Uh, we got the little reactions. We can do some clapping hands. And <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, wonderful job, both of you guys. And this was, this was a fun event. Uh,